Good morning and a very, very warm welcome to our online service from the parish of Wareham in Dorset. My name is Canon Simon Everett uh, and I am the team rector, at least I am for today, because today will be my last uh, online service uh, and later I shall be taking the service in Lady St Mary Church uh, and then I will be retiring from uh, full stipendiary ministry. Uh, it's been a great joy to uh, take these services uh, and they say out of adversity can come good things and of course it was through the Covid lockdowns that we started these online services and uh, now they continue and uh, they continue to help people worship God from their homes uh, or wherever they may be. So it is a great joy to have uh, led you in these services uh, and share with you uh, and I do so today for the last time. So all glory be to God and we start our uh, service with a hymn of praise. So we meet in the name of the living God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we now move into a time of confession. God the Father forgives us in Christ and heals us by the Holy Spirit. Let us therefore put away all anger and bitterness, all malice and slander, and confess our sins to God, our merciful Redeemer. And our prayers of confession, the response, Lord, have mercy. We have not held out the the word of life in a dark and twisted world. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. We have failed to share our bread with the hungry. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. We have closed our hearts to the, to the love of God. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. And may the God of love and power forgive you and free you by his Holy Spirit and raise you to new life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. 
And now the special prayer for the third Sunday after Trinity. God, our Saviour, look on this wounded world in pity and in power. Hold us fast to your promises of peace, won for us by your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And we now have our first reading, and this will be followed by our second hymn. The Old Testament reading is taken from 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 1c to 13. The Lord said to Samuel, I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. The Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said. And when he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, do you come in peace? Samuel replied, yes in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. And then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then made Shema pass by. But Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered. He is tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Samuel then went to Ramah. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
now have our Gospel reading, which will be followed by the sermon. The Gospel reading is from Mark chapter 4, beginning at verse 26. Jesus said, This is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground, night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up. The seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself the soil produces corn, first the stalk, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. As soon as the corn is ripe, he puts the sickle to it, because the harvest has come. Again he said, What shall we say the kingdom of God is like, or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet, when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants, with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. With many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as much as they could understand. He'd not, he did not say anything to them without using a parable. But when he was alone with his own disciples, he explained everything. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Simon Peter was a fisherman. He was often out in his boat morning, noon and night. And when he wasn't out in his boat, he was in the local bars drinking and enjoying himself, particularly if he'd had a good catch. He was a hard man who lived life to the full. He worked hard and played hard. Then one day a visiting rabbi came to town and called Simon Peter to follow him. And he did just that, even though he was a wild man. There was something about this young rabbi that almost compelled him to leave his nets and start life anew. It astounded him that the rabbi should take an interest in him, for he was a sinful man. But the day he was called was the day life changed. Now, the truth is, we don't know very much about Simon Peter before he met Jesus. And my apologies if I have done him a disservice. But the truth of the matter is that what I have told of Simon Peter was certainly the story of Simon Everett standing before you today. With several years at sea under his belt, the 24-year-old was paid far too much money, which was spent on a rather dissolute life of wine, women and song. But then stumbling into a church, life changed. Simon met with Jesus and suddenly God became a reality rather than a nice idea. It would mean a dramatic change of course that would lead to ordination and a life in parishes around Dorset and Wiltshire. How could such a reprobate be of use to a holy and sinless saviour? Well, as our Old Testament reading puts it, the Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. Clearly, God saw something that not even I had seen. Clearly, God saw a tiny mustard seed of faith that could grow and become something way beyond my wildest dreams. And here I am, 42 years later, a sinful man, but redeemed by the cha and changed by the blood of Christ. What does that mean? It means that somehow, by my life and death, by the life and death of Christ, my life has been turned upside down and turned inside out, so that little by little I have become the man God created me to be. Although, as you know only too well, I am still a work in progress. But thank God that with Christ Jesus there is always a second chance and a third, fourth, fifth, sixth even. In fact, there, if we are serious about God as he is with us, there is infinite forgiveness and time for amendment of life. All it takes is faith 
as small as a mustard seed. Jack Higgins, the best-selling author, was once asked if there was anything he knew now that he wished he had known when he started out, to which he replied, yes, I wish someone had told me that when you reach the top, there's nothing there. By the time I reached my mid-twenties, I was coming to the same conclusion, but I didn't know what to do about it, how to fill that emptiness, that nothingness that seemed to be my constant companion. To the outside world, I had it made. I was earning good money. I had a job that took me around the world for eight months of the year, and the remaining four being spent on leave, leading a wild life, trying to fill the emptiness that was there inside. And there are many like this today, people trying to block out an all-pervasive emptiness that so easily grips the soul and eats away. And different people will try de dealing with it in different ways. And the record levels of alcoholism, drug abuse, sexually transmitted diseases bear testimony to this. As do the greed, the consumerism that have gripped many on so in society, meaning ever rising levels of debt, insolvency and bankruptcy. People in, to, in total confusion about their identity, confused about the whole meaning and purpose of life, striving tirelessly, tirelessly to stay alive and terminating it, terminating it prematurely when they know that this is not going to happen. Even before then, and most disturbing of all, is the fact that suicide is the greatest killer of men below the age of 40. This simply should not be. Much of this comes back to the fact that people do not know who they are or what they are here for. They don't know that they are children of God, made in the image and likeness of God, and loved more than they will ever be able to understand. St John tells us, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. That is the truth of the matter, and people accept this uh, and when people accept this, their life will be transformed. Jesus told those following him, I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. Of course, that doesn't mean that Christians uh, have it easy, that every day is going to be a, a party. God knows that for many Christians, that's not the case. In fact, for Christians in other parts of the world, turning to Christ means the very opposite. It means suffering and persecution. It means constant threat and hardship and even sometimes martyrdom. But with the reassurance that Christ is by their side in all that they go through, they know that they have all that they need. Thinking back to my church history at Theological College, one person who made a huge impact on me at the time was a man by the name of Polycarp. He was a bishop who lived across the first and second centuries. It was said he was a disciple of the Apostle John and a holy man who eventually paid with his life for not bowing the knee to Caesar. Polycarp is recorded as saying on the, death, on the day of his death, 80 and six years how I have served Jesus and he has done me no wrong. How then can I blaspheme my King and Saviour? You threaten me with fire that burns for a season and after a little while is quenched. But you are ignorant of the fire of everlasting punishment that is prepared for the wicked. The trouble with Western society is that it has grown too comfortable. And as one very honest person said to me, why do I need God? I have all that I want. This just about sums up the Western world and just look at how it is unravelling fast. None of us knows what the future has in store for us, either individually or collectively. But there is always a choice. We can try and block out what is going on or we can embrace what lies ahead, knowing that Christ is by our side. St Julian of Norwich said, All will be well and all will be well and all manner of things will be well. And with Christ, that is so. I do not know what the Lord has in store for me, but I pray 
that he will grant me enough time with my wife and children to repay them for the considerable sacrifices that they have made for me over the years. I could not have had anywhere near the sort of ministry that I have had without their love and support, and I cannot put into words what it means to have them with me. I thank them from the bottom of my heart, as I thank all those who have helped and supported me and whom I've enjoyed fellowship with down through the years. Amen. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy. Pure 
Now let us pray for the church and for the world and let us thank God for his goodness. Let us pray. Lord, we come to you to pray for ourselves, for the church and for the world. We pray for everyone throughout the world who is living in fear because of the folly of others. We pray, Lord, that you will turn the hearts of those who have set out on the way of evil. Give strength to the peacemakers, we pray. We pray for the church throughout the world, that it may be a beacon in dark places. Give strength to those who must worship on their own without the support of others. And we pray for all Christian communities that they may be places where everyone is welcomed and nourished and loved. Father, today we pray especially for our rector Simon and for Linda as they leave the parish and retire. We are so grateful, Lord, for their ministry. We give thanks for them. Please bless them as they start their new life. Give them health and joy in their retirement so that they can lead fulfilled life, secure in your loving care. And we pray, Lord, for all that we know and all in our parish who are not well. And we pray for those who are mourning those who have gone before us. Will you join me in saying the Our Father? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And before a final prayer of blessing, we have our final hymn.
And now a final prayer of blessing. And may the love of the Lord Jesus draw you to himself, the power of the Lord Jesus strengthen you in his service, and the joy of the Lord Jesus fill your hearts. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and all whom you love, this day and for evermore. Amen. And uh, as I now retire, I do ask God's blessing, continued blessing, uh, upon you in the coming days and years, whatever you may do. It's been lovely worshipping with you. Goodbye.